Right, so I think what I'm going to do next is I'll show you the best known upper bound for this problem. And then I'm going to, in the last part, I'm going to show a lower bound in some uh, kind of restricted uh, model of data structures. And it's going to be motivated a little bit by the upper bound, the, the slower bound, and the restrictions. OK, right. Maybe one quick remark as well. Uh, the online matrix spectrum multiplication also implies the multiphase conjecture, right, that this problem is hard. And I think it, you, know, you need this uh, in 1 by n2 by n3 version, where you'd let n1 be this k, the number of uh, sets that you get in the beginning, n2 is n, the length of the sets, and then I guess uh, n3 here, if you have a uh, multiphase data structure, you can just kind of do all these updates, n3 updates one at a time, and, and ask the queries. So, so you, you know, it also implies the uh, multiphase conjecture with the strongest possible parameters, right? That you cannot do anything non-trivial there. Okay. I'm going to show you the upper bound. And I think, at least, the reason why I started looking at it was, I guess, I, I was trying to actually break the conjecture. I thought, well, you know, maybe this, maybe this is false. This conjecture, it sounds maybe too strong to to be true. So, so that was actually the intention. We didn't manage to break it, but we got significantly uh, better than this one. And I think one very interesting point of the upper bound is that, well, the conjecture says because you receive the vectors one at a time, then you cannot use fast matrix multiplication, right? But the upper bound actually uses fast matrix multiplication to get into the, uh, to, to shape a quite non-trivial factor. Not a polynomial factor, but to shape some non-trivial factor. So this is by me and Ryan Williams. From when was it? 17. So what we get is we get a data structure for this problem that over a sequence of n uh, operations, it solves all of them in order uh, n cubed over 2 to the omega root log n. So kind of weird looking bound, um, but it's at least significantly more than a log factor saving. So we can actually solve a total of n queries uh, a little bit better than, than n cubed time. And the very interesting thing is actually this data structure, the first couple of queries are not solved in n squared over 2 to the root log n. There's a bunch of queries in the beginning that actually take n squared time to answer. And then after a little while, it gets super fast. Or not super fast, but it gets faster, right? Then it answers queries in n squared over 2 to the root log n. So it actually uses this amortization to, uh, to beat this barrier to beat the n cubed. Okay, so let me try to give you the main ideas. And then I can't really make up my mind whether I first want to show you the cell probe version of the data structure because it's super simple. Maybe I should do that and then just show you about afterwards how we turn it into a data structure in the actual, this is an actual RAM model data structure, right? One that in the standard upper bound models. But let me first show you, let's say we're in the cell probe model, right? So this is the one where we could hope to prove this conjecture unconditionally in the cell probe model, right? At least we have non-trivial data structure lower bounds, as you saw in Watching's talk and, and in many other talks, right? So, so maybe there's hope of proving it unconditionally. But I'll show you that actually the conjecture is false for cell probe data structures, right? So you can build a cell probe data structure that can answer matrix vector queries in basically order n to the 3 half time to answer queries. What, I'm show you, what I'll show you here is not n to the 3 half. I'll show you n to the 7 over 4, because this one is simpler than the other one. So I'll just show you the simple one. And th this is the one that, that anyways, gives us this, solu this solution over here. Per query. Per, per, query. Per, per each one of the queries, right? So the total, I guess you multiply with another n to get the, the amortized cost over uh, sequence of n operations. But you can handle it. The cell, in the cell model, we handle every single query n to the 7 over 4. Um, where can one? Find this um, a result? Also in this uh, uh, paper, yeah. Um, and basically, the 7 over 4, the reason why we get it 7 over 4 is because we solve the, mat the vector matrix vector in n to the 3 half. Right, so here we save a half over the quadratic, so here we're going to save a, qu a quarter by doing their reduction, the one we saw, uh, the, the reduction we saw before with going from uh, matrix vector to, on, to vector matrix vector. Um, so what we're going to solve is also a um, vector matrix vector in n squared over 2 to the root log n. Not in the cell model, but in the standard word RAM model. We're going to do this. And that doesn't matter, right, because the, the two factor just goes into this omega. So 
So there we don't care about running the reduction, There's, unless you care about the concrete constant in, in here. Okay. So we're going to solve the vector matrix vector multiplication problem. And we'll do it in the cell probe model first with n to the 3 half time. Let me try to give you the idea of the, of the data structure. And I think it's, it's very simple. All right, so, so what, are, what are the input right is this uh, n by n matri Boolean matrix. And we want to answer these queries. And I think a nice way to think of them is this notion of testing whether this sub matrix has a 1. Right? That's the query. Those are the queries we're interested in. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at this matrix during the preprocessing. Right? We have arbitrary preprocessing time in the cell probe model. Right? We just, just build a data structure, it's a static data structure. So we look for, so we repeatedly do the following. So we're going to have a, we're going to have to store a list. We're going to think of the list L. And L is going to consist of a bunch of pairs. So each of these pairs is a UI and a VI. I equals 1. And they're going to be root n pairs in this list. Up to root, up to root n. So it's going to consist of some pairs. Each of these pairs is, I guess, a subset of rows. UI specifies a subset of rows, VI specifies a subset of columns. And we're going to maintain, we're going to guarantee you that the submatrix corresponding to this pair has no ones. So that's basically what we're going to do. And the way we're going to build it is, so basically we're going to say, okay, so we're going to kind of say, okay, so C, we initialize C to contain, kind of like, like a set that contains all the entries. Okay, so C will kind of be, what are the entries in the matrix that are not contained in any of these sub-matrices that we put into L. Okay, so basically we say, okay, so we start by letting C be the whole matrix. There's nothing in L. And then we say, okay, so as long as well, there exists a, a pair UI, VI, such that, um, let me use this note, uh, A, we call the matrix A. A inside, let, let me write it like this. So if I take A and look at the sub-matrix indexed by UI, VI, uh, it's all zero. Right, so if there exists such a submatrix that's all zeros, and also the submatrix, maybe write like this, so UI, VI intersected with the entries that are not yet covered, um, the size of this intersection is at least n to the 3 half. Okay, so basically we found a large empty submatrix, so no ones, that covers a lot of entries in C that are, have not yet been covered. Right? Then we add UI, VI to C. And then we update C to be, to we remove basically UI, VI. That's the full data structure. We just store L and the matrix as it is. OK. So it's a very simple data structure. How much space does wait, it use? I, I, I think I'm. I'm yeah. yeah. So C is the submatrix. Yeah. And then what happens is the entries that are not contained in any of the pairs up here. Right. Okay, so C starts out, well, in the beginning, this set is empty. So none of the pairs are contained here. So it's just it's kind of just the list of entries in the matrix that are not yet covered by any of these pairs that I took out. So I'm just kind of looking for large submatrices that are empty. And they're large in the sense that they cover a lot of new entries from C that have not yet been covered. Right, so I'm just kind of extracting large submatrices and, and putting them in large empty submatrices and putting them in a list. Uh, yes, that's L. That's a typo. That's right. That's right. Good. OK. So, so this is the data structure. I, I just store all these root n pairs. Like each of them is just an indicator vector, right? So this is n to the 3 half bits in total, right? I'm storing. Plus, plus a, I just store a in plain text. I don't do anything to it. I just store it as it is. So it's like you're removing zero monochromatic rectangles. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm just lo looking for large zero monochromatic rectangles. And largely, I, I kind of want to say that they also cover new stuff that wasn't covered before. Right? And then I'm just taking those out and putting them in a list. OK. Yes. Uh, 
Uh, well, uh, let's see. Yeah, it is easy. So let, let's see here. Yeah. What? Uh, uh, less than equal to square, yeah. So at most square n, right? Because each time I remove n to the three, I have n, so I can only do it at most root n times, right? So that's the important. At most root n. No, no. One is a subset of uh, rows, and the other is a subset of columns. No, they're not necessarily disjoint. No, they just cover more, many new entries each. That's the only property. They may overlap. It's just cover, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'm covering many of the zeros, not necessarily all, but I'm covering many of the zeros by a few large monochromatic rectangles. Yeah, yeah. Good. Okay, how's the query now? So now I get a u and a v. So I have u, I have a, I have v. So basically, I, right, I want to know whether this submatrix is empty or not. Okay, so it's a cell probe model, right? So computation is free. Yeah, I only pay for what I read. So I read all of this L. I just read it all. That's n to the 3 half time. Right, so, I, so I read all of L. Maybe let's call them U. Let, let me write these sets U, V. So then I now I compute. So this is again free, right? So I don't have to do anything to do this. So this cost n to the 3 half cell probes. And then I compute U, V, where I delete everything, uh, all these ui, vi pairs. Let's call this q. So what am I saying? I'm saying I have my submatrix here. Uh, I look at the list, and I know that, well, if anything is in the, everything that's in this list is a 0. Mm -hmm. right, so I know I don't have to look there to f answer my query, right? Mm -hmm. So now I just compute this set q, and I delete everything. That's, already covered by these large rectangles. And now there are two cases. So one of them is, like, let's say the size of Q is large, small than n to the 3 half. What can I do? If, does anyone see what, what is the solution? If I put 1, right? I know the answer is 1, because otherwise I would have extracted UV during preprocessing. Right, because I, I keep going, as long as there is a set that cover a lot of new entries, I keep going, right? So, so I just output one. Done. And else, I only have n through three half possible locations where the one could be, so I just go and look at them. Right, I just check them. Check Q. And that's it. So that's n to the three half time. Um, Super simple data structure in the cell probe model when computation is free, right? Um, That's a bit similar to the uh, protocol for uh, disjointness with yeah. advice. Yeah, yeah, it's very similar. Yeah, 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 I think it's very, very similar. Okay, so let's uh, see how could one turn this into an actual data structure you could implement in the word RAM, right? Where you also have to pay for preprocessing. Okay, so then things get tricky because, okay, so first of all, what is this thing here, right? So ui, vi, that is all zeros, it's kind of like a large independent set in a bipartite graph, right? It's large on both sides, right? This is np hard to find, even to approximate to the n over log n factor or something like this. You can even approximate to a polynomial factor, the largest such submatrix, right? In bipartite graphs? In, if it has to be uh, a large, when, on both sides, yeah, like a, yeah, yeah, so yeah, the, the, if the Cartesian product of it is large, right? So you cannot even approximate it to within n over log n or something like this. So, that, that, so this is completely hopeless, right? So how are we going to even find these submatrices, right? So, so that's bad. Uh, the second thing is how do we, like here we just read it and compute the set here. Um, and first of all, I thought, okay, so ba basically the, the, the way we came up with it was actually thinking about an upper bound in the word RAM first, not in the sub model. And actually we had found a way to do this. And then I got down to, we got down to this problem here, and I thought, oh, this is super easy, right? This definitely looks like something I can do in, in uh, subquadratic time. I, th I thought that first, like, this looks like a super easy problem. Uh, well, let me try to show that this is not an easy problem. So let me try to show you what this problem actually is. And this is where I kind of, yeah, so this is a little bit unfortunate, but it's a very interesting connection to some of the other things. Okay, so what is this? So I, I, I want to compute 
all these pairs that are not contained in, in any of these things that I ex all of these things I extracted. So what what are those pairs, right? So I, what I could do is I could say, um, maybe let me go over here. So I'm going to create a vector uh, for each row of the matrix. So I'm going to have a vector u1 up to un. And I'm going to have a vector v1 to vn, one for each column of the matrix. And then uh, these vectors are going to have length size of the list L. Right? And so in each entry here, in the ith entry, I put a 1 if, uh, if ui is in ui. Again, the capital one. And otherwise, I put a 0. Okay. And I do the same over here. What? No, oh, okay. So yeah, so, no, it's uh, no, it's not the same. Sorry. Uh, okay, bad name. It's called U A. This is uh, yeah. So this is U A. Yeah. Okay. So I just you know, it's just an indicator for every area of the rows. I do an indicator for which of these sets I'm contained in. Right. The same for all the columns. I do an indicator for which sets I'm contained in. Okay. Now, okay. So what am I interested in here? So, right, so, so I have a subset u and a subset of v. So I'm basically saying I can, so basically I, I pick out the, the vectors that I have here. Right, so this is the ones corresponding to my set u. I pick out the ones that correspond to my set v. And now I want to know which of these are not in any of these lists. What is, and do you, do you see? What property do these vectors have? What? It's exactly orthogonal vectors, right? Right, exactly. Right, any of these pairs will be deleted if there's an entry they have in common. Right, so it's exactly orthogonal vectors. Right, on an instance where the dimension is the size of the list. Right, so this is. So it's actually orthogonal vectors reporting. I have to report all the orthogonal pairs in orthogonal vectors. So this looks hard, and actually, if I want to, if I want to break that conjecture, I actually even have to do it for a list that's of polynomial size. It has to be ended to the zero point one or something like this, a zero point zero zero one. So it's and, and the conjecture is that orthogonal vectors is hard even for C log n dimensions. So, so this was a little depressing, uh, that you know, it's, it's a little different because there is a preprocessing kind of you know the set of vectors, and then you you have to report the subset. You ha you're told a subset of both sides. Report all the. Uh, things here. And actually, for three sum, I guess there's a pre processing version of three sum where you have the same and you get a subset of the integers and a subset. There, you can actually beat quadratic for uh, pre processing three sum, but I don't think it's doable here at least for pre processing uh, orthogonal vectors. Okay, so, so that's the hard part. So basically, what we're doing in the cell probe model is that we're just reading an orthogonal vectors instant and, and then we know the answer. Right? That's exactly what the cell probe data source do. It doesn't have to solve orthogonal vectors. It, 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 computation is free, so it just solves it. So that's why we could do it there. So, so that also looks a little dangerous. But actually, so, so what we're going to use is actually a really nice overbound for orthogonal vectors by watching Amir and, and uh, Ryan Williams. So there are some non-trivial overbounds for uh, orthogonal vectors. They're not sub quadratic but they are non-trivial. Um, we have to tweak it a little bit because they can find an orthogonal pair. We have to report all of them. Quickly, so we have to tweak it a little bit. I think I'll actually show you how that goes, as that's interesting too. How you how you actually do it. Um, so maybe let me just write the date for this result. Yes, Fifteen. Will you at some point show us how to do that first? Yeah, or? yeah. Let me let me do that too. Maybe I should start. I, I'll start by do that. So, yeah, so okay, let me show the first part. Because it's actually surprising that you can get around this NP hard problem in the beginning of finding these large rectangles. And this is where we're, we're using uh, amortization, exactly. So, so let's try to see what happens there. Right, so, so basically, we would like to find these large submatrices that are only zeros. But the, the main observation is that we, we kind of only need to find them if our query is actually one of these 
queries that, ha that correspond to a large empty submatrix. So kind of, we only have to solve the NP-hard problem when the query actually gives us the solution. That's basically the idea in, in, the, in the upper bound. So let me, let me try to see how we turn this into Sorry, a... Sorry, I got a little confused. Yeah. We were talking about the query side, but now you're back to the preprocessing. Yeah, now, now I think, okay, I think we went down to, okay, so we had two problems we want to solve, right? We had to find all these things, and then we have to compute this set Q. And uh, yeah, and this corresponds to an orthogonal vectors instance. Okay, but uh, now we're going to go back. Now, now I'm going to go back and give the whole word ram down to to this problem at the end, and then I'm going to show you how you can actually find those in. Okay, and the result that you are alluding to is here is yeah. So this one shows you can actually do something non-trivial for orthogonal vectors. Um, something non-trivial. Yeah, so better than n squared, like something like similar to n to the uh, n squared over two to the root log n or something like this. You can do something like like that, right? uh, which is also super interesting and uses fast matrix multiplication. So this, is the, this is the step that it's going to use fast matrix multiplication is to, to compute this set Q at the end. OK, so, so we're going to tweak it a little bit right, because we cannot really find these large, sub, these large empty sub matrices. So let's see how, how does the algorithm go instead. Right? So we're still going to have this set C that are going to be kind of uncovered entries. We're still going to have a list L. It's going to consist of these pairs U, I, V, I. Um, but they're not going to be completely empty this time. These pairs, uh, they're, they're almost empty. So they're sparse submatrices instead. So in addition to U, I, V, I, we're also going to store S, I. And these S, I's are just going to be a list of all the ones in this submatrix. OK. And let's say that this, this is size at most set for some parameter set we'll figure out at the end. OK. So what is the algorithm now? OK, so the algorithm is basically just we only look at the query algorithm. We don't do anything pre-processing. We're just going to build it as we go along. OK, so, so we get a query uh, u comma v. OK, so we have this matrix. And we're looking at we have this submatrix, which we're going to test whether this is empty. Right. Um, and I, I guess the, yeah, so, so what we do is we start with saying, okay, yeah, if it's small, and we're kind of done, right? So let, let's say we're aiming for something like n squared or set time. Just scan, right? Just scan. So, so this is the easy case, right? The query is a small rectangle, we just look at it, right? That's the easy case. You don't mean n squared. What? Yeah, maybe I should, I choose an, should I choose another? And yeah, maybe set is a bad letter. Okay, T. T. Okay. T. Let's do T. Let's go T. Okay, so we just scan it if it's small, right? That's that's easy. Okay, so now it's not small, right? So we also have we have this list here where there's some uh, where we store some of the ones in the matrix, right? So so what we're gonna do? We're just gonna scan all his eyes and check for. A one in uh, u times v, and if we find one, we're done, right? And then we have answered the query, right? So that's also okay. Um, so now, I guess there's still only like so now we kind of it's similar to before, right? We have all these sub matrices that we kind of extracted and put in a list. After scanning here, then we know now that the query cannot have a one inside any of these, right? Because we scanned all the ones that ever occur in any of these. Right? So so this is fine. We're still down to, now we have to uh, kind of look at this set Q and see whether there's, uh, we, have, we would like to find this set Q and, and look at them. And to do that, we do two, two cases again. Uh, we, we start by doing something, right? So, so we're going to sample n squared over t, our in random entries. Uh, in UV, uh, if find a one, done. So we're just going to randomly. So this is going to be a randomized algorithm. Right, so we look at this matrix, and we're just going to, uh, we're even ignoring these sets in Q for now. We're just randomly sampling entries inside the sub matrix. Right. If we find a one, then we're done. If we don't find one, right, then uh, with high probability. 
it's going to be less than or equal to t log n once inside. Right. Otherwise, by channel bound, we'll have found, found one. So now we actually know that we have a, a large submatrix that's almost empty. Right. So this is basically the, the kind of the NP-hard problem that we couldn't really solve. It's hard to find such a submatrix. But here, if we're not done answering the query, we actually were, were told such a large submatrix. Um, I then again two cases, right? We, we have okay. We still have to. Uh, we have the set Q as well, and we have to answer it exactly, right? So we, you know, we, we still need to find these. These uh, there could be still be some ones in there, and we have to make sure that we don't miss them. But it's it's going to, it's sparse. That's what we know now. So what we know, do secondly, we can also. I guess we can also estimate. Um, the size of C without. U times V. Why is this? All right, so we, we just sample random entries. Um, let's say we, we have this, we maintain this set C that uh, just a bit vector that tells us is this entry covered or not, right? So if I just random sample, it's quickly to test whether it's in C and it's quick to test whether it's in U times V. So I can also get a very good estimate of uh, how big is this set, right? Up to T log N again. Right? Uh, so, so basically, if it's larger than t log n, I know basically how large it is up to constant factors. OK. So what do we do then? So then again, we have two cases. So if it's large, without this uv, Uh, larger than n squared over t. What do we have now? Now we found a, we have a submatrix. It's almost empty because we checked it during the sampling, right? It's almost empty. And it covers a lot of new entries, right? That's, which is exactly what we had as a requirement to adding it to L. And this is where the amortization comes in. So now we're just going to spend n squared time. So we're just, we're just going to do n squared naively. What? So the U T or the, the only zero one from like the first cycle? Yeah. And you want to know if it, it removes a lot of entries from C. Yeah. So it depends on the intersection with C or not. Uh, do, 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 do. Yes. Sorry, that's just a title. Yes, you're right. And this is also what I'm estimating down here. Right. That's what I want to estimate, not not the difference. Good. So I do it n squared naively, but what pays for it is I I collect all the ones. S, and then I add a U, V, S to L, and I update C by extracting, by deleting U, V, because right, now I covered this part as well. Make sense? So, yeah. Uh, so, uh, what are we doing the estimation of, of C? Yeah, so basically I just sample n squared over T random positions in the matrix. I check how many times uh, does it both fall inside C and U times V. And I use yeah, and you cannot compute it uh, precisely because of this. Uh, yeah, yeah, then I have to solve the problem. Yeah, yeah. So I'm not going to solve it exactly. Yeah, I'm just going to, it's fine enough to, to randomly sample and, and estimate it into, I, I get a good estimate. Get some, like, uh, con some it's a constant factor approximation, at least as, at least as long as this has size at least t log n, then it's with high probability a constant factor approximation. Yeah. Okay, so, so basically I add this to, um, to this list whenever this happens, right? And the observation is that even though I spend n squared time here, this whole step can only happen t times because every time I'm, I'm basically going to uh, kill off n squared over t. So I'm, I'm slightly confused by this. Yeah. So if you sample n squared over t times, yeah. I'm just wondering, what are those, either that n squared over t or that n squared over t, uh, it feels like it ought to be. They don't have to be t, but I'm, I, I'm basically, I'm just, I'm just, I guess I'm in, in hindsight knowing that the running time is going to be dominated by n squared over t, so I'm just going to use as much sampling time as I possibly can. Right? So that, that's, oh, I see. I yeah, see. That, yeah. So the sampling time doesn't, you're just, you can afford yeah. it. So yeah, I, exactly. I can afford it. I could have, I could have done with less, yeah. and it would still be fine. Yeah. Um, but I'm just doing as much as I can because I'm anyways going to spend n squared over t somewhere else. Yes. Uh, good. 
So if it's large, then this is the case. Finally, right, then we know that this Q, which is uh, equal to C intersect U times V, which is equal to U times V without the union of all these sets in the list, a UIVI. It's small. Right. That's the last thing, right? I, that's, this, is what I, this is the last thing I have. So basically, I, I know that there are only a few entries I need to check. And now I have to find those entries and check them. Right, so, so I, I want to find those entries and check. So, okay, so maybe we can try to figure out what is the running time for all the other steps except finding this Q. Right, so let's try to, to look at the running time. Okay. This is at most n squared over t. Uh, per query. Um, this thing here is at most, okay, so how many do we put in the list? Right? The list has length at most t, the t, t sets as i, each as i, um, right, we know that this as i is small, where is it? Uh, so so we, basically we know that there's most t log n once in each of these as i's, right? So that's another, so this is basically a t squared log n. So let's ignore the log n, right? Let's never, never mind the log n. So that's a t squared. This is another n squared over t. This is an n squared over t. And this, it's n squared, but it can only happen in total t times throughout the entire execution of the algorithm, right? So if you look at the entire execution of what n cubed uh, queries, right, then we get n cubed over t plus uh, n t squared plus n squared t. Right, I think that's, that's the whole running time, right? But throughout a sequence of n queries. Plus this thing here. So maybe we can say this we can solve in t of, uh, I guess it depends on n and and then t. And then we get another n times t. t. Yeah. And also, uh, checking here is also only n squared t, right? The check is, once we found the entries, it's fast to check them. Sorry, what was t about t times t? It's just, I think this is the time it takes to find q. I don't know what it is yet, but whatever that is, this is going to be the running time of, of the algorithm. Okay. Uh, good. So I guess what remains is how do we find this Q? And it's, it, we're basically going to solve this orthogonal vectors problem, right? So, so what do we have? Right, so we have an instance of orthogonal vectors like we said before, right, and, and so we have n vectors here. The dimension d is t, right, it's the length of the list. Because they have an indicator for each element of the list, is it in ui? So this is the one set, this is the u set, I guess, or the first set, and the, the second set is this v, and the d is also t here. Yeah. And a query now asks for all the sub, like, so I guess if you write it as a matrix product, I guess it's the, uh, so this is an n by uh, t, t by n. And basically you're, you're asking for all the ones inside a submatrix, right? That's, this is what you're looking for. We want to find all the ones in here. And also we are promised that there's at most uh, n squared over t of them. Right, so output size. And the problem is there's, there's quite a lot of them, so, so we need to be a little careful in how we, we report all of them, right? We want to report all of them in basically n squared over t time, is something like this. Okay. And this is uh, where we're going to use 
this really nice result by uh, Huaqing and Amir on, uh, on solving this is talking about vectors. It's just super surprising all around. I, I don't know where it, it, it's really beautiful. It's surprising, I think. It started with Ryan Williams' uh, all pairs shortest path where he get n cubed over 2 to the root log n. This is where the idea first appeared. Uh, so I guess it's a connection to a lower bounds in circuit complexity that he's using to do upper bounds instead. Yeah, to do upper bounds instead. So let me try to see if I can explain what's going on there. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, basically we're going to look at a circuit for computing orthogonal vectors. Okay, so I'm going to look at a circuit that can uh, tell me, given two sets of vectors, is there an orthogonal pair in here? And I'm going to look at it where, I guess I'm going to have a parameter s, that's the number of, uh, of vectors that I get as input. So how could I build it? What would a circuit look like for orthogonal vectors, right? So, so I guess it takes this. I'm going to draw the input down here. I don't know, do circuit complexity people draw the input at the bottom or the top? Bottom. bottom. OK, like in neural nets and stuff. <laughs> Good. <laughs> so, right, so I have uh, uh, d, or maybe let's stick to t, right? t is the dimension. t input bits for each of, so I ha basically I, I'm going to have s input vectors here, and then I'm going to have another s input vectors over here. OK. So now I'm going to, uh, for each of the pairs, I'm going to build a piece of the circuit that computes whether these are orthogonal or not, right? And how, what does that look like? Um, so let me see. So I want to write it as, uh, let me see if maybe I should check my note. Just to be careful, I want it, what I want to do, with one way. OK, so I want, so basically, I want to do product between all of the individual, right? So that's. I'm a little confused. So just the, the, just the parameters change. They were n keys. Yeah. So s here. Some. Yeah. I'm going to solve. I'm going to. Yeah. So I'm not going to build a circuit for all n. I'm basically going to build a circuit for much smaller uh, than than n. And then I'm going to use fast matrix multiplication somehow to to do it over a whole lot of uh, pairs and faster than naively. Yeah, so, but I'm going to, I, I want to do it using XORs instead, I think that's, and, and product. So I'm going to do it over, I want to do it over F2, that's the basic idea. So I guess, uh, I have to be careful because there's one of them that doesn't work. So I want to do, right, let me see. So the orthogonality, right, so I, I, let's, let's call one of these pairs X and Y. So they consist of X1 to XT, Y1 to YT. And I guess, so, so basically, I guess I, I want to have uh, xi, yi up here. And let me think, do I want to do 1 plus? I think I want it to be 1 if they are orthogonal. Let me just let's try to remember what, I was, what the thing was here. Uh, let me see, two seconds. No, this is not, no, the other way around. Um, okay, so the basic idea, okay, so if you look at the end of these two, right, if, if you, it's, uh, you, have to, you have to do the or of x1 times y1, x2 times y2, x2 up to xt times yt. And the idea is I'm going to pick a uniform random subset of the coordinates instead. Right, so I'm going to randomly sample each of these t coordinates independently with probability a half. Yeah, it is, right. And then I'm going to XOR them. Yes, exactly. It's, it's, so, so I'm going to pick a random subset of these, and then I'm going to XOR uh, over the subset. So, so basically, I'm going to do XOR or J in a random subset of XJ, YJ, like this. And now, what do I get? So what do I get here, right? This is, uh, if orthogonal, I'm going to get 0. Right. If not orthogonal, one with probability half. Right. That's that's the basic idea. Now I'm going to what I'm going to do is I'm going to repeat this a number of times. So I'm going to repeat k times. Okay. And so what I'm then going to do is I'm going to do the product from i equals 1 to k. 
and then I'm going to do 1 minus the XR. This is the same as plus O F2 plus the XR over J and RI, so the ith random sample XI, XJ, YJ. Right. So what happens here, right? What happens is that if they are orthogonal, this pair, right, then each of these is always going to be zero, so it's always going to be one, so the output's going to be one. Right? So I'm going to get one with probability one. If orthogonal, I, I'm getting, going to get one. If they are not orthogonal, we just need one of the random samples to give me uh, a one, then the whole product is zero. Right? So not orthogonal. Get zero with probability one minus two to the minus k. Okay. So, okay. So I'm going to do this for each of the s squared pairs in the circuit. I'm going to do such a random sample to to create this monomial, a polynomial here. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to say basically I want to do at the end, right, the orthogonal vector says, is there at least one pair? So I have an outer or over all these pairs, right? And for that one, I'm just again going to randomly sample half of them and do an XOR. So I have an outer random sample where I'm just going to do XOR. And here I'm not going to bootstrap, I'm just going to do it once. So, so I have an outer random sample where I'm just going to XOR over random subset of, subset of pairs. like this, right? Then I know that if there's an orthogonal pair, then the output is going to be 1 with probability at least a half. If there's no orthogonal pair, the output is going to be 0 except with probability 2 to the, uh, except with probability 2 to the minus k times s squared, right? Because there's s squared pairs, so I need to union bound over all the s squared pairs. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set k to be like a large constant times uh, log s. Right, so some constant times log s. Then, you know, oh, I'm only going to, on a, if there's no orthogonal pair, it's only going to be polynomially small in s probability that I output 1. If there is an orthogonal pair, I'm going to output with probability a half. Right? So I have this random polynomial, and if I can evaluate it on all these inputs corresponding to an orthogonal vectors instance, I'm going to be told, at least if there was an orthogonal pair, I'm going to be told probability half that this orthogonal pair is there, right? So then I can repeat it a logarithmic number of times, and then by high probability, I'm going to find it if there is one. And if this, uh, it's still polynomially small in S, chance of a false positive, so that's not going to happen. Right? So, so that's, that's the basic idea. I, I just need to get probability half, then I can just repeat it a couple of times, a logarithmic number of times, then I'm going to find the orthogonal pairs with high probability. Okay, so now I have this, this circuit here, uh, this polynomial. Now the question is, how am I going to use that over here, right? So somehow, what happens? And the basic idea is, if well, I look... I think you probably need to explain this, but yeah. at the moment, it's mysterious why... I mean, instead of taking a random sample, you could have taken the whole thing. Right? Uh, no, if I... Well, X, well, this part here? Uh, which one would you want to take the whole... Oh, well, because the XOR... Would yeah, it's F2. Yeah, yeah, exactly. exactly. You need to... Yeah, so, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so you have to XOR. Okay, so what is the idea? The idea is that I can evaluate this as an inner product between two vectors, where one vector depends only on, on the X, on one set of the inputs, and the other half depends only on the other inputs. So let me try to explain how, how can I evaluate this as an inner product between two, two vectors. Wait, one more question regarding what Mike asked. So the reason why you sample a random subset is yeah. to control the degree yeah, because yeah, because if I had not sampled, then it would I would get exponential in uh, the degree would be linear in, in t. If uh, this is what going to eventually dictate the square root log n. Yeah, or, yeah, so exactly. Now you're gonna get to that. Yes, that's now I'm going to get to that. Exactly, that's what I'm going to dictate the square root n. Because if I had done the product over everything, I would have if I had just written it out explicitly, the degree would have been t. So, so just to be Yes, I'm just going to look at the normal monomials. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm going to do. So that's what I'm going to do. So let, let's do that now. So let's go over here. 
So how can I evaluate this? So if I expand out this product, right? So I, at the outer one, I have some sum over S squared pairs, and then I have each of these inner ones. I want to see how many um, monomials appear in this term here. Right, so I just write it out into a sum of products instead. Right? And basically you can see that every term has degree at most k in the xj's and most k in the yj's, right? And it's even symmetric in that sense. Right? So, so the, the, the number of monomials is basically going to be uh, t choose k, right? Or the sum up to t choose k. Yeah. And then I'm going to have uh, s squared of those. Right? That's the total, total size, right? Good. So what I can do now is, so, so all of these, I guess it's like, so, so I have all these different x's, have different y's. So what I do now is I, I take all these monomials, and then I can form two vectors, one that depends on only the x inputs and one that depends only on the y inputs, right? So I'm going to, so in this, there's going to be a, 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 some monomial that's the, like the product over a bunch of uh, coordinates. Uh, some coordinates dA of x, j, y, j for some x and y, right? That's what this polynomial looks like if I expand it out. There's going to be a bunch of these monomials. Let's call one of them m. So I'm going to have a coordinate for m, and here I'm just going to write the product over j, x, j. Right? This depends only on, on the x inputs, right? And likewise, I'm going to have another vector here where at the same monomial I'm going to write the product over the j's of y, j. Right? And now, the inner product over F2 of these two vectors is exactly the evaluation of this polynomial. Make sense? Just have one more. So if this were a univariate polynomial, mm -hmm. then I mean you don't need to you don't have to use I mean this is just a Vandermon matrix right. uh, multiplied by it. Yeah, but univariate over F2 would be trivial, right? Then there's no powers and no anything. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think it's a the higher powers of yeah. something is yeah. just. So, so for multivariate, there's no analog of like. Uh no, so, so we have to use some matrix to, to get it to work right. But but we can form this. The, the basic idea is that we can. Right. So so remember again, what we're trying to do is that we we basically have this orthogonal vectors instance, right? Where we have, we have we have to find all the orthogonal pairs in an instance here. What we're going to do now is we're going to take the vectors and cut them into little pieces of s each, right? And now, okay, this product, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I want to know whether for each of these s by s blocks, I want to know is there an orthogonal pair in here? Right? That's what I want to know. That's, that's the goal now. I want to figure out is there an orthogonal pair in here? And the observation is that, right, I can, from this chunk here, this whole chunk of s things, I can compute such a vector here that represents what would it be if I fed those into this random circuit or this random polynomial that I, that I did. Right? So I can construct this vector for each of those. So what I do now is I basically I just take this instance of orthogonal vectors, I cut it into little pieces of, of s vectors each, t coordinates, and then I'm going I'm, I'm to, so basically now I'm going to form a new matrix. It's n over s large, so it has one row for each of these chunks up here. And that row is going to be this, this vector here that only depends on the s input. So now the number of coordinates here is going to be, I guess I deleted it. It was this uh, t choose k, and k was c log s times s squared. I guess you can see this is, a, this is exponential in S, so like this, this term doesn't really matter, right? So, so maybe we can just ignore it. But let, let's write. So it's going to look like this. And, and likewise, you do it for the other one, right? So it's, it looks something like this. So this is, again, an NOS. OK. So what have we achieved now? So now we, what we have done is that, OK, as long as this thing here, if this happens to be less than NOS to the 0 0.1, then we're in the rectangular matrix multiplication case. Right? And then you can solve it in basically linear time. Right? There's an old uh, 
fast matrix multiplication algorithm that can solve this, then you can solve it in NOS squared times log squared of NOS. Right, so you can to solve this matrix multiplication product. So that's what you do. Right, we're going to solve this matrix multiplication product. The output is going to tell us which of these chunks has a, an orthogonal pair in them. That's the, the basic idea. Once we know that, uh, we just go through the whole chunk and check the matrix A inside the whole chunk. Okay. So, so what is that going to cost us, right? I guess that's the last part of the analysis. Now, how much is this costing us? So you go there to detect, right? Uh, to, to kind of to find. Yeah, we're going to just go there to confirm whether there was actually, yeah, we just check it and uh, good. Because those are the entries that could potentially contain a one inside our stop matrix, right? That, that's, yeah. yeah. So, so I guess going there, right, so we, we need to, the output size was basically n squared over t, so that's going to be something like n squared over t of these outputs, and there we're going to pay s squared in, in each of those. I think that's what we're going to going to pay, because we have to check this whole s squared sub matrix to, to, for, to see whether there's, an, there's a one in there. This is one term of the output. And the other term is, uh, right, so we get, we, get, we get this. N squared or S, or N over S squared here. Yeah. Maybe let's write N squared over S squared. Okay. And then we had this last term here that has to be less than basically N to the 0 0.1 or something like this, right? That's, that's the last requirement. Okay. So, right. So what does this mean? Let's see. So basically, we're, gonna, we're just going to choose uh, our t. Right, so we have to satisfy this. Let me see if we remember here. So what, what do we have? So, so this is basically um, take log on both sides. Right? Then we need uh, c log s times log of t over c log s to be less than or equal to 0 0.1 log of n over s, or something like this. Right. So we need to do this. Let me see if I remember. Okay. Good. And, right, so what do we gain up here if we look at it again? Um, so let's figure out what we can set t to be as a function of s, perhaps to get rid of the, yeah. So what we can set t to be, let me see if I remember correctly, uh, what is it we're doing here? I'm a little, now I kind of lost the, what is the step we want to do here? Let me think for two seconds. I think we want to do log t to be log, basically let's ignore the div division thing here, log n over log s, I think. Right, so we're going to set t to be 2 to the log n over log s, up to some constant factors. So then we get n squared over 2 to the log n over log s times s squared, n squared over s squared. Is there something missing here? Maybe I need, maybe if, I, if it doesn't work out, we'll guess we'll just have to. What? There's some constant factors that I ignored here. Let me just see that. What? Say again? No, it's a product, right? It's this binomial coefficient that I took the log of, right? So it's a c log s times log of t over c log s. Yeah, with an e, perhaps. Don't you just take log s and you take the root log n? Yeah, I think that's what we do, right? Yeah, we said, yeah, so if we said s to be 2 to the root log n, right, then we divide by 2 to the root log n, and I think we need to put it a little bit. 
Yeah, it's, it's so there's some constant you put here in front, and then you, you save it on both sides, right? Let's see. Uh, I guess you want to set these two equal, right? So I guess you want to have uh, s squared over 2 to the root to balance things out over log n over log s. You want this to be equal to 1 over s squared. Put the s squared over and move this over, right? So to the log n over log s should be equal to s to the fourth. I guess you take logs, log n over log s should be 4 log s, and then you get, you divide by the 2, you take the square root, so then you get uh, log s should be 2 root log n, right? If you balance it out, and then you get, uh, yeah, and then again we go back to this one, then these two are balanced, so then I guess it's n squared over s squared, and s squared is, uh, so this is s is 2 to the 2 root log n. Right, so then you get 2 to the 4 root log n. And they're balanced, we set them equal, so I guess this is what you end up with, right? So, so it set s to be something like 2 root log n, and then it, then it works out. Okay. Could you do a quick summary? Yeah. Of, so this was all to calculate this uh, fine t. Yeah. Could you just summarize what you did to find t? Yes, let's go. <laughs> yeah, so they got a little lost in the calculation. Okay, so we want to find Q. And then the observation is, well, the way we're going to do it is we're going to say, okay, we're going to take the matrix, and then we're going to cut it into little pieces of uh, S rows and S columns, like this, this, this orthogonal vectors instance. And then what I'm going to show if I have an S by S instance of this orthogonal vectors problem, then there's a really large circuit, or polynomial, if you will, that can output whether there's an orthogonal pair in here. Right? And it's, it's large in the sense that it, it has size, uh, basically, s squared times t2 c log s, right? So it's super polynomial in s. But as long as this is, but, it, but it, then I expand it out into this polynomial, if you will. For such a polynomial, um, I know I could create two vectors, one vector corresponding to this part of the input, another vector corresponding to this part of the input, so that the inner product of those two vectors tells me the answer to the orthogonal vectors instance. So then what I do is I, I, I basically I want to, so now I basically I have all these different inputs. I have NOS different inputs over here. I have NOS different inputs over there to, to this circuit. And I want to kind of batch evaluate all the, all the pairs in this Cartesian product. And I can do that with the vectors because that's exactly what matrix multiplication does. It computes all the pairs of these vectors, uh, all inner products between all these pairs of vectors. So that's why I'm going to take all these inputs to the circuit and I'm going to put them, there's NOS of them, one for each of these. I'm going to put them in a new matrix. The, the, no, the, the dimension now of the matrix is this T2 C log S. Right, but S is small, so this is okay. I do the same over here. As long as this is like N to the 0 0.1, I can use fast matrix multiplication afterwards to, to do all of these cross evaluations in, in, in basically NOS squared time. Once I've done that, I now know which of these S by S sub matrices contain, uh, could contain a one. And then I go and look at them just to, to find the ones in there. Yeah. So, yeah, so that's the, that's the full algorithm, right? So you kind of leverage fast matrix multiplication to find a batch evaluate all these pairs of uh, inner product. And that, this is basically what you did in, in, in your paper on, on this, this whole reduction to expanding these polynomials and using fast matrix multiplication to, to do all these. Good. So all the, all the, rest, of the, algorithm, the rest of the algorithm is kind of just combinatorial. You're just sampling and looking and storing stuff on the side. And then you need to solve this orthogonal vectors instance at the bottom. And, and this you can do using this fast matrix multiplication idea. It has to, it, that would not even suffice, right? I think it has to be near linear because you also have to go and check all the entries afterwards. And, and I th I'm not even sure. Oh, maybe, maybe you can still, yeah, that could be. Uh, what does current fast matrix multiplication boil you mean? Um, but here you're using the rectangular version of it, right, where, where one of them is n to the 0 0.1. Then you can do it in linear time. I think that, that's what you're exploring. You can do linear time uh, in, in that case. Linear in the output size, yeah. If there are fewer monomials, it could still, well, 
we have to get down to polynomially many monomials to, 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 if you want to break the conjecture, right? And then you'd also, I guess, solve with orthogonal vectors if you could get down to a polynomial number. Of, yeah, yeah. So I don't think it's too much to hope for, I think. Yeah. Does it make, so does it make sense to try and explore it? Because it's not an arbitrary matrix multiplier here. It, it, it arrives from. It arises from extracting large submatrices, so I don't know, maybe you could have an arbitrary instance in here. Polynomial evaluation right? Yeah, it, it's so kind of like a batch polynomial evaluation or a bunch of different over Cartesian product of things. Yeah, yeah. So maybe you could do something different there. Yeah. And it's almost multivariate, right? Yeah. Multivariate yeah. Polynomial. Yeah. Matrix multiplication step here, I assume. If you could avoid the blow up, I guess just look at the polynomial directly and not expand it into this huge monomial and do inner products. Then maybe, yeah. yeah. Good. So, so here, the, uh, the sub problem of finding all pa pairs of orthogonal pairs is the only bottleneck of the reduction. Yeah. Uh, so the, uh, okay, so I guess that's different from the orthogonal factors itself, but is there any reduction? Like, uh, I don't think so. So one issue is that if you want to break the conjecture here, you also have to solve. You have to actually solve this orthogonal vectors instance on a polynomial large universe, like n to the zero point one, oh. if you want. So it's in that sense it's harder, and you have to do it still better than quadratic time. Uh, yeah. Okay, so maybe, maybe I'm wondering like whether one v implies if one v is hard, does that imply orthogonal vectors? Uh, we tried, but uh, again, this this problem with the polynomial size universe, I think, is. That's even harder. That's, right. it, that's in the good direction. Just to the wait. No, no, But this is also uh, like OV, you can define it over uh, vectors of dimension n to the epsilon. Yeah. And essentially all the lower bounds still follow. So, so it's not a big deal. Like. Yeah. So it would be interesting to show that uh, OMV implies the orthogonal vector conjecture with dimension n to the epsilon. Yeah. Yeah, I think Ryan and I actually tried to do that, and I, and I think using that assumption, it works in the beginning, but I, I think there's something like you, when you have to find all the pairs, and then you, and, and it's fine in the, in the top level, but when you do this recursion to try and, like just from detecting a pair to finding a pair, the ratio between the dimension and the uh, number of vectors change, right? The dimension doesn't go down, but the size of the instant goes down, and then, then it doesn't work for n to the epsilon anymore. Like at some point you get down to n by n by n or something. Yeah, so we, we tried to do something like this, but we couldn't get it to work. But here you are doing some, uh, you just, if you detect the, the, a vector in a, in a small uh, instance, you just go and uh, yeah. check everything. Yeah. So that wouldn't work. Uh, I, th I think when we tried to balance it out, it, it was still such that if you assume orthogonal vectors is hard down at n to the epsilon or something, like if the dimension is n to the epsilon or something. Uh, I think to remember it still breaks exactly, uh, that, that you know, it doesn't give you anything. Uh, for hardness, it's been it's been five years since I thought about it, but I, I seem to remember that it breaks down exactly. No matter what you assume in this dimension, as long as some into the epsilon, it's going to break down and, and exactly give you nothing in terms of solving a thumb vector online. But if you solve orthogonal vectors uh, like much faster, like n to the one point five time, like, uh, the dimension is uh, oh. so one over four. Oh. Seems like you should still be able to gain something. Yeah, maybe maybe then. Yeah. That's a good question. Yeah, yeah. Good. I don't know. So what is the result of a rectangular matrix multiplication using these things? So I, I don't remember. Yeah, I think it just says if there's some parameter, like there's some constant around maybe 0 0.1 or something. I don't know exactly what it is. Such that if I have an n by n to the 0 0.1, by n to 0 0.1 by n matrix, then I can do it in n squared, uh, log squared n time. So, so I can basically do it in, in linear time as, as soon as if, if this inner dimension is small enough. Like there's some concrete constants. You know how that's done? No, it's one of these stars and like. Did you know? Yeah. Really? <laughs> yeah. It's like a old identity by Comfort Smith. Say it again? There's, there's an old paper by Comfort Smith from like the okay. But it's not, I mean, is there a key idea or is it? Uh, 
Hopper Smith out of nowhere writes on algebraic identities that she shows. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I see, I see. But it, there's not like a key intuition. It, it's just something that you learn. It, it, you came but up with. It's like similar to Strassen's algorithm, but like there's an identity and then you recursively use it. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I guess this is a good time to do the last break, and then we can look at some low amounts afterwards. Yeah. yeah. No, not the la not all the last part. This is in the. Yeah. The cell problem was that then this orthogonal vector problem was trivial. I just read the problem and then I know the answer. I think that was the. Yeah. So that that was I just you know I just read the list of all the u's and all the v's, and then I don't have to do anything. I can just compute the, the set q without computation. So yeah, so the, then, then I could do it much, yeah, much faster, just fine. Yeah, and all of this matrix multiplication, all this stuff was just to, to actually make something that works in the word RAM. Um, it was like, uh, yeah, the data search is trivial in the cell phone model. It's just store these sub matrices, and that's it. Yeah. Let's resume in uh, 1130. This one, yeah, it's Coppersmith.